Welcome to the Art of Procurement podcast. My name is Philip Heidson, a 20-year procurement practitioner, former head of procurement and advisor to procurement leaders around the world. I started out of procurement to help leaders and their teams access the resources they need to increase their impact through insight-driven procurement. You are listening to our flagship podcast where we pull back the curtain and shine a light on the strategies, tactics, and tools that leading procurement teams are using to align their impact with the needs of their business. And today on the show, I'm delighted to welcome Jakob Gorm Larsen. Jakob is the head of digital procurement for Maersk and someone that I followed for a long time due to the insights he shares on digitizing procurement. Well, Jakob recently published a new book. It's called A Practical Guide to E-Auctions for Procurement, How to Maximize Impact with E-Sourcing and E-Negotiation. And so I invited Jacob on the show to share his best practices in leveraging e-auctions. Based on his experience of setting up a program where more than 1,000 e-auctions are run every single year. So let's go into our discussion and I start by asking Jacob if he found procurement or if procurement found him. I, I guess it was a bit of, uh, a bit of both. So uh, the way I got into procurement was uh, that I did my master thesis many years ago on, at the time it was called electronic uh, knowledge sharing. Uh, Mm -hmm. And as I was uh, finishing that thesis, uh, Mersk was looking for someone to establish a an online knowledge community, and it was more or less spot on with the theme of my thesis. Um, Okay. So I, I applied for it and got the job. And then yeah, it wasn't really procurement at the time, but uh, but, it, but it quickly evolved into procurement. So um, and, so I've, I've stuck around also because I like it. And today, what is your, just for listeners, what is the, the role that you have within procurement, like your day-to-day role? Yeah, so so I'm, my, my title is Head of Digital Procurement uh, for Maersk. And, um, and you could, you can basically cut that job up into two parts. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's one which is you can say setting the strategic roadmap for digital uh, activities yeah. within procurement in Maersk. Uh, I do that in in close collaboration with our CPO, so I have a lot of discussions with him around sort of the future of procurement. How will digital impact it? Mm-hmm. Also, the global leadership team um, spend a quite a lot of time on that but really where I spend most of my day-to-day uh, uh, job is then together with my colleagues in digital procurement running the operation so all the okay. solutions that we have in place making mm-hmm. sure they uh, are running that they're supported that we execute all our sourcing events auctions that catalogs are uploaded etc uh, etc et so it's a mix of operation and you can say a strategic uh, right. transformation that we are doing of procurement well, you mentioned um, e auctions and and kind of over, having oversight for uh, how Maersk actually uses e auctions, and so that's really the the key topic of today. I do have a couple of questions later to talk more generally about digital transformation in the procurement space, but you um, have just published a book called A Practical Guide to E Auctions for Procurement: How to Maximize Impact with E Sourcing and E Negotiation. And so I have a few questions around uh, e-sourcing and e-negotiation because, you know, it's one of those topics that's, um, you know, I think we've used as we've used the auctions as a procurement community for probably 20 years now, but it's kind of ebbed and flowed of um, being in vogue, not being in vogue, maybe in vogue again, and lots of reasons for that. Um, As I kick off just to kind of level set, uh, you start the book by saying that how we define e-auctions is critical to their success. And so I just love to get your definition of what really is an e-auction. Yeah, so, so, and I think that that is really the the fundament for for having a strategic approach to e-auctions is that you apply uh, the right definition to it. Mm -hmm. And my definition is, is um, is mentioned in the book as well, and I I, I define it as an online market driven uh, negotiation uh, based on total value and with commitment. Right. And can, can I, and if I can add a few words to it, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's slightly long, but uh, but I, I I elaborate more on it in the book. But there are really two things that are important, which differentiate auctions significantly from uh, 
from from other things. And and one thing is that it's market driven, meaning that it's a competitive uh, negotiation. So you are mm-hmm. not sitting across from the suppliers, but it's actually the market that negotiates or determines the price. That's that's a key component of it. And the other critical component of the definition is the last part on commitment. So many right. people think because you do online events, then you can characterize it as an auction. But mm-hmm. it's only an auction if you have commitment in it, if you have skin in the game and you're willing to award business based on it. Yeah. Or else then it's just an online uh, benchmarking exercise yeah. that you're doing. Um, no, that's actually so important. It's you know I was going to kind of jump in on that commitment part, as you said it, because that's what I've seen one of the you know, just throughout my career where re-auctions have not been successful is because there hasn't been that commitment or uh, there's been one or two where there hasn't and then word gets out. And once you start getting known that, you know, you're not necessarily going to follow through on the results of an e-auction, then it just jeopardizes your whole e-auction program because people don't have trust in it and therefore they're not willing to be as aggressive as they can be. But, but And you're spot on with that comment and, and you know, imagine, you know, traditional negotiations that... You give your partner a handshake and say, "Yeah, we have a deal," and then you call him the next day and say it and say you you gave it to somebody else. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, that that won't be well received because we've shook hands hands on it. And yeah. when an auction that's market driven, that also means that the the participants can actually see how things are going. So often they can see whether they're winning or not, and that can be a, a doubled. It's the sort because you know they will know whether they're number one when it when it ends. Uh, yeah. So so yeah. commitment is absolutely critical, and all there's a lot of research on it as well, and it shows a clear correlation between you know a concept called procedural fairness and the quality of your uh, relationships as well when it comes to to e auctions. Now, would you recommend, uh, because this is something that I've, um, you know, observed and seen um, from others is when you're running an e-auction, one of the ways that that people sometimes kind of get around that, not necessarily going to award the business to the lowest bidder is to say, you know, that the e-auction is just is part of the price discovery part of an RFP, if you are a sourcing event. And so we're going to take into account all these other things and we may discount um, the negotiation, the e-negotiation. Is that something you recommend or is that something that's just making things murky and giving you an excuse again to not necessarily follow through on your commitment? So there are many ways of doing it. In general, I would not recommend using e-auctions just as a price discovery mechanism. Mm-hmm. But, but what I do recommend is to have a total value approach, meaning that if there are other types of discount, if there is switching costs from the incumbent, if there are a different terms that they offer or superior service levels, then build it in upfront uh, in a value model, which you can then include in your bid model. Yeah. So that what, what the suppliers are evaluated on in the auction is the total value, and hence it's also the the, the best uh, bidder or the best total value offer, which is number one at the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, either that, or else uh, what, what another way of doing it, if that is is not possible in a given situation, is not to commit all of it upfront, but be upright with your bidders and say, hey, it's not the lowest bidder that will get a hundred percent of the business here. Mm-hmm. Number one uh, will get, I don't know, 40% of the volume and number two will get 20 and the remaining 40 will distribute as we see yeah. fit. Yeah. The key part is, again, you're upright around things, you know, upfront so people know what they're going into. Yeah, they have that transparency so there's no surprises when they think that they're going to get awarded 100% of the business and they end up with 10%, let's say, you know, if they, even though they're the lowest bidder. But it's not, and, and it's, 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 I don't consider it um, difficult or controversial. Right. It's just about being honest and upright mm-hmm. with how you do business and then apply common sense. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. That's well, I see but, I, but I think it's a mindset thing sometimes. Yeah. It's like, you know, how are you approaching an e-auction? Are you approaching an e-auction to build, you know, a... Um, a, a market driven, you know, collaborative relationship where you're getting um, price discovery faster, 
or are you using it to just try and squeeze the life out of a particular category or commodity, uh, minimize the margins, and it's still just a transaction? You know, and if you go into it the latter, you know, unfortunately, people who, you know, events that you've seen where that happens, they didn't really care about the suppliers, and that's a hard thing to say. They just care about the bottom line price. Um, and I think that's a mindset thing as much as anything. But it's also there's also a key difference in short term thinking and long term uh, thinking, right? Because if you want to do this sustainable in a sustainable way for the long run, you can't you know you can't cut these corners. Right. So you could you could also have the reverse situation where a supplier is not winning the auction. But 15 minutes after it's over, he calls you up and he says, listen, I didn't win it, but um, I've changed my mind and I would actually like to go even lower. Mm -hmm. You have to turn down that cost. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's about values and and you can't compromise values. Um, so, So it's not only about driving the price down, it's about having a fair, transparent an extremely efficient process. If you and if you do that, in the long run, you will get the best possible. You'll get the true market uh, uh, mm-hmm. price um, it, that you can get. So, so it's not only about squeezing price when you talk values. It's also actually about potentially saying no to savings yeah. if they come outside of the the negotiation process. That, that's a great point. You know, you got to condition all the participants to know that you know that you're serious, and that they can't just kind of play the game as a benchmarking exercise for themselves and then come back later. This is um, this is where you win yeah, exactly. So, so this is where you win and where you lose business. Yeah. Now you talked about the in the book the kind of history of the e auction, and and I, I remember probably twenty years ago I was I started my career in automotive. And so um, back in the day, um, you know, we had free markets and we were pushed to use e-auctions for every single thing that we bought. This is probably 2000 to 2002, 2003. Um, And, you know, you see a lot of examples where e-auctions didn't work and um, perhaps put people off because they didn't use them the right way. I'm interested, like, as you've observed the the usage and the perception of e-auctions, how was that kind of changed as as the use of e-auctions has matured so it's it's a it's a fantastic question and it's it's one of those questions that i also over the years have spent a lot of time you know reflecting on mm-hmm. and i would say the best answer so far uh, to it i i got um, actually as part of the process of writing the book uh, because i reached out to glenn meekham who um who was the guy who invented e-auctions 25 right. years ago. And that's probably been, you know, that has been a fantastic experience to, to get to know him, uh, especially as part of the process. And, and you know, e-auctions is something I've spent so much time on over the last decade. So spending time having a, a very long conversation with, with Glenn uh, around his experience with it was has been a fantastic uh, experience. Uh, mm-hmm. But but this this question was actually one of the things we we spent quite some time talking about, uh, and and I what I think happened was that when free market was introduced, you they you know the team at free market spent you know a lot of time developing uh, practices, uh, developing the technical solution. They took. Uh, out, I think, 26, 28, a, a lot of patents, uh, at right. least, on different pieces of technology. But probably the most important thing was that free market, both Glenn, but also some of the uh, the um, the early employees there, they all came with a solid procurement background. Yeah. So they understood the importance of e-auctions not being a black uh, magic box that just deliver cost savings. Now, an e-auction will only deliver the true value if it's tied to a professional sourcing process going in front of it. And they understood that because they came from a, a practitioner a mm-hmm. background. So they understood the importance of, of proper pre-qualification of, uh, of suppliers. 
uh, of uh, explaining it, of commitment that we talked about before, etc. Um, but but when free market then went through their IPO and their value more or less exploded on uh, on Nasdaq, you saw a lot of. Uh, newcomers entering yeah. the market because the, the you know it, it was i guess you could call it a gold rush yep almost and within a very short time frame you saw 10 if not 20 different competitors introduced to uh, to free market and not all of them had you know professional procurement people behind so they did see it more as a quick fix mm-hmm. You also saw, you know, a lot of companies that were building up very high expectations on we can take this much or this much of our spend through and they did it without really thinking it through or having a proper strategy around it. And and that led, I, I think, to a, a downturn in the use of, uh, of e-auctions. That combination of poor technology entering the market And then unrealistic uh, expectations uh, driven by people with perhaps not deep enough insights into uh, how you should apply auctions from a, a strategic point of view. Yeah, that completely makes sense. You know, my own personal experience was I think put me off using e-auctions for years because you know we were, ended up being in an environment where we were just pushed to use e-auctions at all costs, like it was a numbers game. You know, how many e-auctions you used was the metric. It wasn't necessarily what the impact of that was. And so, you know, I inherited a category where they'd been used, um, where, you know, some of the participants, like they were being used in monopoly situations where uh, some of the participants were random. I remember one, some manufacturer from the Dominican Republic who had no ability to, uh, you know, even think about making the component that was being bought, you know, and the volumes that were being bought. But they'd been found from some supplier discovery tool Um, you know, you get those thrown into an e-auction and the, 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 the bidder knows the market better than you do. And you end up with prices that are actually higher than what uh, you yeah. went in in the first place. And, uh, you know, from that, I mean, like I say, it was years before I used e-auctions again, because I just saw the damage that can be done if you use them incorrectly. And, and you know, it, it comes, it, it all, it, it all comes down to this discussion around values and how you apply these things whether it's mm-hmm. commitment which we talked about before or the situation that you're describing here with where somebody would would do it with in a monopoly situation and either try to trick in uh, suppliers to bid in a, in an auction where there's only one bidder uh, or log in and, and place fake bids as a as a ghost uh, bidder in mm-hmm. the process a- and if you do that you kill all chances of running a professional program here. Yeah. Um, and that's why, you know, another recommendation I have in the book is develop sound principles. What are the values that you're driving this mm-hmm. program around? And put it up on your company's corporate website. And and one of the things that we have on our website, and you can find it on, on Merce.com, is that we would never do an auction with one bidder. Because yeah. if there's only one bidder, it's not market driven. And then back to the, the importance of the definition: if it's not market driven, it's not an auction. Right. So, um, so it's key values how you behave in this if you're in it for the long run. Now we're 20 years plus now into using e-auctions within procurement, and I just wonder. I'm sure that you've seen a, a lot, you know, over those last 20 years, especially as you're working, you know, on a program and in a program right now every day. Um, what are some of the things that you find that a lot of procurement professionals today don't know about e-auctions that perhaps they should, or perhaps put another way, like perceptions they have that are incorrect? Yeah. So there is, there's a lot of myths still surrounding uh, e-auctions, and and they of course created out of some of these bad practices that yeah. we um, that we've talked about. But I, I'll, I'll just mention two of them, which which I think procurement professionals should be more aware of. And one of them is this point around total value. That an auction is not just a price game. Yeah. You can build value models that incorporates both the hard as well as the soft uh, dimensions. And in the book, I, I outline a number of ways of how you can 
assign value to both soft and hard things. What I often hear is from 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 colleagues and peers that you know I can't assign a value to this, and my response is, well, you do it anyhow. Right. Because if if you don't assign a value to it, how can you ever pick a supplier? Mm-hmm. You don't. You, you just don't want to put it on paper or have, or make it a conscious choice. You do it with your gut feel, but but you still assign value to it every single time you pick a vendor. Um, so, so that's one thing. This this importance of having a total value approach, and the other uh, thing that that I think a lot of people are not getting right is to have a proper process for yeah. e auction strategy. So. All, I think any company today will have a process for strategic sourcing. Depending on the consultancy you've worked with, you will have five or six or right. seven steps. Mm-hmm. But very few companies have a structured process for uh, developing a professional auction strategies. Mm-hmm. And that's also one of the most important parts of the book is that I share uh, the process that we've been using and developing over the last uh, decade. Uh, because it's important that you go through uh, this to ensure that you design the auction in a way that reflects the market you're negotiating in. Because a lot of people think an auction is an auction, and I'll just copy what I did the last time. But the market can be very different. You can have more suppliers or fewer suppliers. Mm -hmm. It can be more complex. It can be uh, more competitive, even though there are fewer suppliers. It can be that your objectives with the auction is different, that it's not just a price game. It's actually also around uh, process efficiency, for example. So it's extremely important to have a structured process to go through when you do uh, your auction strategies. I say now, my team, we do north of a thousand auctions uh, every year. So it's not that we sit and go through, you know, very detailed um, <laughs> for every single auction uh, right. through the process. But that's because they've been trained. Yep. So they know exactly what are the questions I need to consider and yep. the sequence of those things. But if you're new to auctions or if you're not, you know, if you don't do a, a 10 or 20 every week, then it's, it's a big help to have a framework that will guide you through to ensure you consider all the, the right mechanisms as part of designing your auction strategy. Now, how important is, the, is your engagement and communication with the supplier as part of that strategy to make sure that they've got buy-in? Because we can create you know, the, the most complex e-auction um, strategy in the world, but if we don't get buy-in from the market participants, you're always going to struggle getting the results that you might want to get. But but you know it takes two to tango. So yeah. supplier or bidders, they you know they're a critical part of this. And I think there are three levels of of communication that you need to consider when engaging with suppliers. There's the there's the the you could say the practical engagement with suppliers around training them, mm-hmm. um, priming them, uh, motivating them for for this specific event. And that's you know training showing uh, their login ensuring that they are that they're ready at the right time you know that that tactical uh, uh, communication and then you have a, a another level of communication which typically comes from the spend owner which is the, the most important message there is around mm-hmm. commitment to the process yeah. so that they understand that this is not some uh, e-auction desk that is now running a negotiation it's still uh, Tom who has been my Mm-hmm. Uh, contact uh, for the last five years that is owning this spend, but he's now communicating that this is uh, how we, we we this is the process we follow, and the last level is the overall, and that's back to the values here that you communicate clearly to the suppliers w- your commitment to to them, you know, with regards to we comply to our own process and we do it in an in an upright and a fair way, but also communicate overall. This is the kind of behavior that we expect uh, from bidders uh, that take part in our auctions. Yeah. So we will treat you as a serious partner, but we also expect you to do the same with us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when you do that, you don't end up in a, 
in situations where suppliers are, are just bidding off, and then after the auction, they won't honor the bids uh, anyhow. Uh, yeah, it's, if you, if you, just bidding one time to then try and observe everybody else in the market, so they can get some market data. It, exactly. So it's 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 about ensuring that you communicate right at these three different levels. Um, that's that's how you you ensure that suppliers are onboarded uh, in the right way. There's also there are different schools of thoughts as to you know how much can and should you communicate with suppliers before, under, and after. Mm-hmm. And my rule of thumb there is almost the, the more you communicate, the better. Yeah. Obviously, you can't share information about the market or other bidders. But but coach them and guide them and, and most importantly encourage them to yeah. to take part in in the process. Do you find these days? I mean, now what are we? Twenty twenty one again. We've been doing the auctions for a long time. Do you see that when you're approaching suppliers and you know they're informed that this is going to go through an e auction? There's a you know an acceptance and that that's just you know a way of doing business. Or do you still find that the kind of heart sinks? And they think that they're just going to be kind of nickel and dimed out of what margin they have left. Like, what's the approach from suppliers when you're bringing them into an e auction? I, I think most most uh, most suppliers today they know that this is part of the game, uh, at yeah. least for certain uh, categories. Uh, and then when you introduce it to new categories, and especially you could say more high spend strategic categories, it's a it's again extremely important that you level set communication and expectations uh, up front. So if you have a strategic supplier at a high spend category and you decide now is the right time to run auctions for this, the supplier should not hear about it from the auction desk uh, as mm-hmm. the first uh, message. Then you call them in and, and you potentially you bring in someone like me to explain what this, uh, what this process is about. But again, also very important, explain to them that this is a total value approach. We honor the outcome of it. We believe this is the most fair and square uh, way of doing uh, um, this type of negotiation. And, and when you take the time to explain it in a proper professional way, then people also accept it. Yeah. Um, as you think about when and when to use an e-auction and when not to use an e-auction, are there particular categories of spend that you would say, you know what, perhaps any auction isn't the best approach or certain market dynamics. I know we talked about, you know, if you have a, uh, a single supplier, mm. uh, that's uh, obviously not a good, um, it's good, not a good mechanism because it's not going to be market driven. But are, are there areas of spend where you say, you know what, I don't think that's right. Or can you really run anything through any auction so long as you've taken the care and attention to uh, structure it in a way that's appropriate for whatever you're buying? Yeah, so, <clears throat> so that's also an, an evergreen in, in auction discussions. Yeah. And, and my take on that is that it's only the market that determines whether you can do an auction. Mm-hmm. And the way I describe that in the book is that I say there are two parameters, basically, that, that determines it. And one is you need to have competition, i.e. more than one supplier. Yeah. And the second element is that you need to have commercially attractive business. So if you are if you are not attractive in the market, bidders will not find it attractive to take part in your in your process. Mm-hmm. That's the you know that's the things that determines whether you can run an auction. There are other things that are critical, and one of them, of course, is that you have clearly defined requirements. But but as, as I'm always saying, you, you also need clearly defined requirements to do a traditional negotiation. Yeah. Or else then you don't know if, the, if they don't know really what they're bidding for. And mm-hmm. so the only difference is that it becomes more evident and transparent that you haven't really made that definition when you do an auction because it's, it's, more, it's a more transparent process. With, with, but with that set around the market, it's it's that's that is that is indicating what you can potentially do. It's of course another question what you decide to do. So, but but from an auction point of view, I don't I don't consider any categories to be out of scope. 
Mm-hmm. There's no technical limitations right. to what you can cover. It's all about the market. And then, of course, all about your procurement strategy and, and how you see that. Uh, and that will also then impose uh, limitations to it. Mm-hmm. Actually, the biggest factor that is a bottleneck when it comes to to auctions, that's the mindset of the procurement organization. Right. So, you know, I've seen that over the years as well, many, many times where we've done hugely successful auctions and then there's a switch in personnel and then suddenly nothing can happen. Uh, or the other way around where we haven't been able to do it for years and then somebody comes in, typically a young uh, procurement talent who uh, nobody have told that we can't do this and mm-hmm. then we do it and it becomes an, an enormous success. Yeah. That's an interesting point. You know, as you think about organizations who, because you said before, you're doing a thousand plus e auctions a year. For organizations that haven't really started on doing e auctions yet, for whatever reason, and there's, there can be many reasons why they haven't, where where should they start? Should they? Well, let me ask that in two ways. From a technology perspective, um, you know, how, how do they even access the technology they need to be able to run an e auction? And second, do you start doing some pilot programs? You know, particular categories that would be good. Um, pilots, like where would you recommend somebody start if they're not doing anything today? So on, on the technology piece, I think there are many excellent tools available and, and all of them are uh, SaaS. So it's um, it's also fairly easy from a technology point of view to get mm-hmm. started. Uh, and in terms of where to get started internally, where if I was to start all over and and now I think back uh, 10, 12 years to when uh, when I took over our program, um, I would look for, you know, open-minded stakeholders. Yeah. The category is less important, mm-hmm. but, but work with someone who is open for this because the way this goes is that you start, um, you, you do run these pilots and then you get success and then you're allowed to do a few more over here and so fuel, you know, success will will create more success. So it's a matter of getting started, um, build momentum, also to get the attention. And then when you have had, when you have a certain momentum and you sort of, you know, it works and you you're you're confident around it, that's where you then begin to build sort of the the big plan of how do we systematically assess which part mm-hmm. of the spend we should uh, we should take through auctions. Now, going to that end, then the flip side, when you're doing a thousand of these a year, uh, that can seem really overwhelming, you know, when, and of course, a lot of organizations don't have the scale to do a thousand, but a lot of organizations have the scale to do a lot more than a thousand. Um, as you think about how to structure that, you know, to enable that within an organization, you talked a lot about a framework as being really important, but operationally, do you recommend that um, there's like a, a center of excellence, so to say, for e-auctions? And that may be one person, it may be five people, depending on your business. It might be half a person. Mm-hmm. But they have some kind of central coordination or that it's uh, just a, a, a another part of the buyer's job that they you know need to become the expert in e-auctions as well. So I, I don't think I've ever come across a company that was truly successful with e-auctions without them having some kind of center of excellence. Mm-hmm. And I think there are two roles that are critical in the center of excellence. Uh, and one is the hands-on support that uh, you that it can provide to the buyers. So you don't want um, you, do, you don't want practicalities to become a barrier for doing auctions. And if right. a buyer says, listen, I, I haven't used this tool for nine months and now mm-hmm. I need to run an auction on my strategic category, a lot would consider that as a barrier and would then stop doing it. Yeah. And so what we bring in is, we say, listen, we have people that do this every single day. Don't worry about that. All you worry about is the communication to the vendors. Then we'll take care of the rest. Mm-hmm. So, so that's a, a critical that you can eliminate those practical barriers for, for adoption. And the other critical role is, you could say, the program manager. So the person owning the overall uh, target setting, the person um, developing the change management plan, driving uh, the, the adoption, 
also challenging uh, the the senior category managers, for example, when they don't want to play ball and don't right. want to do it, and they consider uh, e-auction training as a um, yeah. you know as a system training. Mm-hmm. It, it's uh, you know I've never done a system based training in e-auctions, but I've done I've probably done more than a than a thousand auction strategy workshops where you know explaining the process you know educating people in how do they develop the right strategy and discussing it around specific uh, uh, projects etc so you need that role as well the the change agent the one really pushing it forward also uh, ensuring the executive support uh, and and i don't think you can you can do both uh, in one person actually mm-hmm. so uh, but but you're absolutely right Center of excellence, they come in many forms and shapes. Uh, sometimes it can also be half your job. Uh, it can be a full, full-blown full team of, um, what do we have, seven, eight people, yeah. maybe nine, doing more or less just this. Uh, but of course, it can be a lot less depending on the maturity and, and adoption of your program. Yeah, and the scale. Exactly. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I think from personal experience, I would probably hold my hands up and be one of those that was always trying to make some excuses as to why I couldn't use an e-auction because, oh, my my category is too complex or, you know, what happens because I'm negotiating where you have three suppliers on the market and I know which ones, which line items are important to them and which aren't and how to pair them all up so we still get the best deal. You know, you kind of tell yourself this narrative of why, and oh, I don't know how to use the technology. It's going to take me longer. I don't have the time. So anything that you have to help um, break down those barriers, I think will be hugely important to actually a program like this being successful. And you are absolutely right. And I can also tell you, you're not the only one who, who sees it like that. It, it even have a name, right? It's, it's called a NIMBY. Not in my backyard. It's, right. uh, and it's... Uh, it's uh, it's you know it's it's for people who ex- exactly as you explain understand and actually buy into the concept at a conceptual level, but just not on my own category because it's much better if you do it over here with the other guys. Yeah, mine's far too complicated. Yes, <laughs> and it's also it's also insecurity because yeah. if if you you know you're not fully comfortable with the process, and honestly speaking, I also think that there is. Um, Sometimes you need to address the fact that, that what do you do with a category manager that has negotiated a category for you know plus five years or more, and then you run an auction and save thirty five percent. You know, some people would be afraid yeah. of that result yeah. because that could make other people reflect on why didn't we do that before? Right, they didn't know the market and um, all those kind of things that it looks bad on me. Exactly, and it's it's not a fair comparison because it's it's a different, uh, it's a completely different approach. So you will get different and and better results, but still, I, I understand the the resistance from from that point of view. Now, this may be a controversial question, but do you think that the art of negotiation is becoming less important for a procurement professional as we now seeing? Um, you know, obviously, we talked about e auctions today and their increasing usage, but as technology kind of comes and overtakes other elements of a traditional negotiation, like contract language and, uh, you know, perhaps business terms and things like that. I just wonder where you stand on how technology ultimately is going to impact the negotiation and human negotiation. But I think there's a massive change in front of us when it comes to technology and negotiations, not only uh, auctions, of course, but Mm -hmm. overall. So I think it'll be, you know, traditionally, a, a good negotiator is a um, very experienced person who knows all the tricks from years and years of horse trading or haggling, if yeah. if you like. Um, I, I think, you know, that um, y- you won't see that in, 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 in a number of years. It'll be mm. much more a number game. It will be algorithms optimizing, finding the, the best deal, for for you and also for for the bidder side. Yeah. So data people with data uh, understanding and capabilities they will be the future stars of negotiations but also procurement uh, overall. 
it, it won't be the old school uh, uh, negotiator that that has uh, done done haggling for for yeah. 25 years. They're a dying breed, I think. Which is it's kind of fascinating and and scary and provides an opportunity all at the same time because that's what we built so much of the profession of procurement on, isn't it? Of being well, with a professional negotiator, you know, so much money is being left on the table by the business, by the stakeholder, whoever you want to term as the bad guy, um, you know, who doesn't know what they're doing and is spending all this money that the company doesn't need to spend. Um, and so we've positioned ourselves as that being our value proposition. Uh, and I agree with you. It's a lot of the things that we considered as procurement professionals as being strategic, and I use that term loosely, uh, truly aren't strategic or they're going to be overtaken by technology. And, and, you know, that's also what makes this difficult and challenging, right? Because nine out of 10 people who goes into procurement and, and builds a career in procurement, they do it because they love spending time at the negotiation table, mm-hmm. right? Closing a good deal. That's where well, that's they the get deal. Their Yeah. And, and now here you come and tell me that an algorithm or a system uh, will, will take over that. That's, that's usually not well received, but... No. That's how it is. I have just one question to um, ask you. This is more generally about digital transformation. And I want to ask this because there was a really fascinating passage in the book about uh, Parkinson's law. And uh, you wrote about the idea of Parkinson's law and the impact it has on really the perceived success or otherwise of digitization. And I just wonder if you could share a little bit about your thinking, you know, and and the experience obviously you've had from the other part of your job, which is really being responsible for the digital roadmap for procurement at Maersk. So I think, you know, I read about Parkinson's Law maybe a year or a year and a half ago in a, in a, in a fantastic book called uh, Soda Work. Mm-hmm. And it was so spot on with some of the challenges that, that we see. And so I, I had to pick it up and I use it. Um, a lot in our internal discussions as well. And the, you can say that the gist of the concept is that as you automate tasks, unless you are very dedicated and focused on ensuring that you realize those benefits, you will end up automating forever, but people mm-hmm. will just find other things to do. Yeah. Uh, not out of bad will or intentions, but it's just human nature that you you know, and now I don't do this anymore, then I have this good idea. And that's to a certain extent also fine. But, you know, the reason why we do automation of procurement is because we want to drive a transformation of procurement. So we want people to do something radically different. And unless those new activities that we want to take on as, you know, as part of of automation uh, of, of certain tasks, unless they're structured and you know, driven by a conscious choice, you will end up in a situation where after doing a ton of automation, where you have the same number of people to, and doing slightly different uh, things, and then a very expensive uh, digital setup mm-hmm. with a lot of automated uh, solutions. And, and Parkinson's law describes, you know, that complexity in it, uh, very well, uh, and that's why I, I decided to include it in the book, and that's why I I like it uh, so much because it, it it makes so much sense uh, when you look at what is going on, not only within auctions but within uh, procurement uh, in general, and I think all other areas where where you drive automation as a as a strategic uh, agenda. So it's it's really uh, so important, as you mentioned, to um, to quickly reassign for example efficiencies so if uh if automation is creating efficiencies to reallocate that time or reassign that time to something that's um that's in keeping with the direction that you're going in with the benefits you want to realize as opposed to just kind of let that role expand naturally you you have to be ruthless in Mm -hmm. how you track and follow up on those efficiencies delivered and it's not easy discussions, and I'm, I'm in a lot of them every single week, yeah. because I can see from the systems how much we have automated. I can also see the organization is changing, but it's not changing fast enough. Mm-hmm. And and it becomes, of course, very tough discussion sometimes. But I don't think there's any way around it, and you have to be 
very rigorously in how do you track automation, how do you document, and how do you ensure that it really comes through and that you do see a reduction in this type of roles and an increase in this type of roles. Yeah. Um, yeah, I saw something similar in the outsourcing space. Um, you know, I was heavily involved in outsourcing earlier in my career, and you'd see the same things happening. And, you know, uh, with outsourcing, because it's people-based, you know, oftentimes those roles would come back. And um, with automation, you know, the that activity, that task should be taken away for good. And as, as you say, the, some of the discussions can be difficult because they can relate to headcount and our, our allocation of headcount. But um, otherwise, you're just kind of left questioning what the ROI was. I spent all this money automating and everyone felt good about it. And um, But I'm still spending more money than I was before. And my process is just as inefficient. Exactly. And I can tell you, this year, we have introduced a transformation KPI for every department hit. So it's their KPI. It's not Jacob who is providing the automation support. Mm -hmm. It's not my KPI. It's their KPI for how do they intend to transform their organization. And then it can be some have a a target of two, other has one of 10. But it's their KPI, and I'm then supporting them with solutions to achieve that objective. But you have to track it that rigorously, or else then you will not be successful because of Parkinson's law. Right. Well, I know it's about time to wrap up, Jakob. So I want to thank you, first of all, for your time and for sharing some of your insights, both from the research that you've done and obviously from your personal experience um, as a user and as a, a leader, you know, um, helping others u- use e-auctions. Um, I have a last question I say in every podcast. It's kind of the easy question. Um, and that is, um, you know, if people would like to learn more about the book, if they'd like to connect with you, where will be the best places to find you? So I'd say LinkedIn, I'm very active on. And yeah. um, as I hope it also comes through in this podcast, I'm, I'm very passionate about the whole question on, on e-auctions. So if you're listening to this podcast and you would like to discuss uh, e-auctions, if you're interested in buying my book, then connect with me on, on LinkedIn, send me a message, um, and then uh, we'll take it from there. Okay, great. Well, I should also say that it's, of course, it's available on uh, various online bookstores, etc. Mm-hmm. But uh, but connect on LinkedIn, uh, and then we'll take it from there. No, I was going to jump in as well and say that uh, the book is a practical guide to e-auctions for procurement, how to maximize impact with e-sourcing and e-negotiation. And what I'll do is um, in the show notes episode for sorry, the show notes page for today's episode, which is going to be at artofprocurement.com slash podcast. That's where all of our podcasts are, the directory of pods we have. Um, In the link for today's page, in the notes for today's page, I'll put a link for your LinkedIn profile, uh, but I'll also link up the book um, to the publisher website as well so people can find it directly there. Super. Thank you. Well, one last time, I want to thank you so much um, for sharing your experiences with us, and I'll talk to you again soon. I want to thank you for listening into today's episode of The Art of Procurement. To go deeper, including access to transcripts and actionable outtakes from the podcast, join the free level of our AOP Mastermind community. To learn more, go to artofprocurement.com mastermind. And to find our entire back catalogue of almost 400 episodes,